There are artists in all fields in the world, actors, singers, writers, painters. There's also an artist in what we call an unconventional profession, bank robber, and the nonpareil among them, you might say, the, the Caruso, the Laurence Olivier of bank robbers, the Shakespeare, <laughs> is Willie Sutton. And Willie Sutton's uh, memoirs have now been published by Viking that he wrote in conjunction with uh, good old sports writer Lynn. That's uh, what was Lynn's first name? Ed. Ed Lynn, the sports writer, mm -hmm. and uh, Willie Sutton. And it's quite a memoir. In a sense, it's a study of a, an unconventional artist. In a moment, the program after this message. What am I doing, I ask myself, standing on the corner at 6 o'clock in the morning, freezing my ass off? Hell, I am almost 49 years old. I have been a fugitive for three full years now. I am number one on the FBI wanted list. If I am caught, I will go back to prison for life. They don't even have to catch me for another bank robbery. All they have to do is to get their hands on me. Even to me, it makes no sense. I have a safe harbor in Staten Island. I have $50,000 or so stashed around that I can get my hands on with a couple of phone calls. And still, I am out here on a cold winter morning putting it all on the line in order to rob a bank for money that I need the want nor need. The most brilliant student of the criminal mind that I have ever known once told me that banks would always present an irresistible challenge to me. And any doubts I may have had about that are now gone. I am not only determined to get this bank, I am determined to get it my way. Even though my modus operandi is so distinctive that I might just as well be leaving my calling card behind. And thus the memoir begins as Willie Sutton himself was reading the opening passage, which leads to the question, Willie, Willie Sutton, why? Why not needing the money, putting everything... Why, why do you have to do it? Why can't you resist the challenge of that bank? Well, I think there's a lot of variance to the, these causes of why somebody does something. They are not ever singular. For instance, I came from a very tough neighborhood, and on the same block with me there was an associate of mine named Joe Flanagan. Now he uh, was born under the same circumstances as I was. He associated with the same companions, and uh, in all in all, uh, uh, things should have been almost the same with us. But Joe Flanagan became a priest, and I became a professional criminal. Yeah, but I'm thinking about, I don't mean why you became a bank robber. Right. I mean, what is it about the bank? You've robbed about 100 or so. Right. And in your case, wholly non, we should make that clear, your approach is wholly nonviolent. Right. Precise opposite of it. Right. It's use of guile. Right. Isn't it? Well, that was my modus operandi. I used various uh, uniforms, like policemen's uniforms, postmen's, messenger boys. I even pose as, uh, as uh, window cleaners and things like that. And that was, uh, my uh, thing was more or less deception than uh, what they practice today. These bank robbers uh, go out to terrorize people and to instill fear in them. But my, uh, my uh, method was just the opposite. My method was to assure people that they weren't going to get hurt. And I got the full cooperation from them people because, you know, in order to instill, if you instill fear in people, they, they can go, uh, uh, they can get very excited and they can frustrate what you're trying to do. You have good, by the way, before we come to your technique and some cases, and they, they're here, you know, chapter and verse, you cite Sutton's Law, Willie Sutton's Law. Right. You know, like we have laws in science, right. Sutton's Law. And you rob a bank because that's where the money is. Right. And <clears throat> now Sutton's Law, I mean, uh, that there will live long after I am dead because it is a law in medicine. And Dr. Doc, D-O-C-K, uh, he uh, attended Harvard University. He's one of our leading uh, physicians. He was the one that uh, 
uh, formulated this Sutton's Law, and, and the, the law is known all over the world. It's in all the medical books. And uh, the law is that uh, they should do what I did, go directly to the, to the point uh, that uh, you're focusing on. In other words, they shouldn't have all of these preliminary uh, uh, examinations that the symptoms point to a definite uh, 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 the disease or something like that. They should immediately attack that from that point. The doctor was using your approach to banks as an approach to patients. Isn't that it? As an approach to patients. Mm -hmm. Using your approach. Yes. In his world as a medical approach to get to the patient. Right. Yeah. In your case, it's to get to the dough. That's right. That was it. See? That's right. And so, but also, Sutton's Law also that is like a mountain. Mountain climbers are always asked the question, why do you climb mountains? And they say, because the mountain is there. Right. In your case, so in your case, like, a, like it's a challenge to you, is that it? That's right. It was a, an irresistible challenge, and uh, the more opposition I got, the more determined I was to uh, uh, do a successful job. Now, you know, uh, you can't operate very long before the Bankers Association sends out pamphlets to all of these banks to, uh, you know, frustrate any future robberies. Well, I used to be able to uh, foresee all of these things, and uh, by the, the method I had of investigating banks, it required a lot of patience and persistence. And uh, I could always determine what... Uh, what new uh, method they had of trying to frustrate me. Let's go back to the beginning, and then perhaps a good example, one of the banks you robbed, you know, right. with two of your colleagues and how you handle it. The very beginning, before that, though, uh, you were attracted to the technique, were you not? A certain technique of wit rather than brute force. That's right. And terror was the use of wit, wasn't right. it? Right. So, you know... Uh, People like in banks, you see, I figured the, the, the psychology of this, that the, the people in banks are a little more intelligent and they're, they're more aware of danger than the ordinary person. And uh, when I first entered a bank, I uh, got in before any of the employees. And the first man that come in, I would I mean, ask... How, how, first, how do you get into the bank, first of all? Well, I would use some kind of a ruse. I would either use a uniform... And uh, like, if, for instance, when I, uh, say, used the messenger boy's outfit, I would have a book in one hand and a pencil in the other. So when I rang the bell and the armed guard would come to the door, I would say, I have a, me a message here for the, uh, the bank manager, and I would know his name, say. So I would hand him the book with one hand, and I would put the pencil in his other. Mm -hmm. So he had both hands occupied, and I'd reach over and I'd take his uh, pistol out of his holder, see? Well, the first employee that would come in, I would learn his name. Say it was Joe Foley. He would know a bank robbery was taking place. So I would explain the whole thing to him, and I would sit him down on, on a seat I had lined up there, and I would tell him, uh, listen, uh, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I wish you would please cooperate with me because nobody should get hurt in something like that. So I says, will you explain to the other people that come in what's happening here that this is a robbery? So as the other that come in, I would take him by the arm and I'd say, will you go over and sit with Mr. Foley? He'll explain the whole thing, you see. Now this here, they wouldn't know a robbery was to taking place. So when they'd sit down next to Mr. Foley, Mr. Foley would tell them, this is a robbery. Yeah. Well, it was, the, you know, it was almost incredible. They didn't believe it, you know, but uh, finally they did. <coughs> And, uh, you know, they would explain about, you know, that these people are not here to hurt us and it's not our money, it belongs to the insurance company and so forth. And there's no reason why we should get hurt over this money and so forth. Well, that's the way they would reason, see, and I would be waiting for the manager, which was usually the last man into the... Now, this is the, the big bank. challenge. The manager is the that's big challenge. That's right, see. Now, when he would come in, he'd seat all of the employees seated, you know, in the, the chairs, like, you know, away from uh, where they could be observed from outside. So he'd say, what is this? So they explained to him. By that time, I was over beside his side. And to give him an out, I would say, now, listen, you are the manager of these people. 
Now, if anything happens, uh, something might happen to these employees. Now, you're responsible for these employees, so please uh, cooperate so that there's not going to be any uh, trouble here, you know? So then he would think it over, you know, and he would have an out for himself. You know, he could always say, well, if it was just up to me, I would have disarmed them or something like That's that. That's the thing. You know? and then, see, here, Willie, now, you are the psychologist now. I took And, up you know, you're giving him a great out. See, if we're just challenging him, his machismo, right. as was the authority chair, he would, so you give him an out saying, we know, I know that if it was you alone, you'd challenge me, but you're right. thinking about the welfare of your employees. That's, that's right. why you didn't. That's, that's right. the out you're giving them. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> and it always worked, too. I never, I never had any trouble in banks. That is, nobody resisted me. I never came away from a place, you know, like uh, uh, hot in any way. I always walked away casually as if I was leaving the bank. In fact, I robbed so many banks that I began to believe I was a bank employee. I walk <laughs> in and out as if I uh, actually well, worked there. Let's, stick, let's follow through on this one robbery for the moment as an example. So now the manager comes in. Now, he has the comp... You, you want to get into the safe, into the vaults. Right. Yeah. He, he, two guys have the combination. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'd find out who the head cashier was and also the manager. See, that's where the, the thing is. This is a security thing that they have, you know, that one uh, employee doesn't know the whole combination. So, like, for instance, the head cashier would know the first two or three numbers and the manager would know the last three. So it took the two of them to open the bank, see? And, uh, you know, as uh, we went down there to open the bank, you know, I would uh, try to uh, be a little humorous and so forth, you know. Well, what is the conversation you'd carry on? Well, as I'd walk down, you know, I, I'd, I'd say, uh, this is an experience that's going to live with you a long time. You can tell your friends about <laughs> it, you know, and so forth, you know. And uh, they probably won't believe you, you know. <laughs> But uh, anyway... Uh, You're I, making them feel good then. That's too. right. I was trying to build that confidence mm -hmm. up at all mm -hmm. times. And I succeeded in a great mm -hmm. many cases, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think that uh, the fact that no violence has ever been committed is something. You know, people, are, it's incredible that I, 75 years of age today, have never fired a pistol. Not even at a target range, you know. And most of the times, I never even had to display a pistol. I had it in my pocket. But I don't didn't know somebody asked me, well, suppose you got in a real tight jam and somebody resisted you, you know, would you use the pistol? Well, I used to be very athletic in my days, you know, and I used to learn a lot about judo, you know. And I had a lot of confidence in my own prowess to disarm mm -hmm. somebody without using a pistol, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, that's one of the reasons I think that, you see, like some people, I mean, uh, they resist because they think the person is nervous and they have the point and a pistol at them and it's shaking and they think that pistol is going to go off. And it's not because they want to, uh, you know, resist the man, but they do it like as a matter of self-defense. But I mean, like where no uh, display is of the pistol is uh, made, uh, they feel very confident, you know, and yes. uh, you know they're willing to cooperate. It, you generally work you that you work with two colleagues generally. That two, you, the three of you at work generally, aren't they? You have two colleagues. Well, I had one uh, partner for a long time, and uh, only like on a very big bank would I take two two accomplices mm -hmm. because there's so much uh, space to cover that you can't do it with one or two. You know, three, all the times I ever went to prison was because of uh, accomplices, uh, you know, were uh, ratting on me. But, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those You sort of demolished the myth of honor among thieves. That's right. Yeah. You see, that's, there is a myth, and there's no doubt about it. And uh, <clears throat> it's a case of, you know, uh, them trying to protect themselves at the expense of somebody else, you know, and I was always the fall guy for it. You, you have know, never they, done that. You have never, no, ever never, informed. No, no, Didn't never. the government authorities once want you to act as an informer? Well, yes, that was a friend of mine. You see, in my early years, I had done my first sentence, and while I was serving sen uh, my sentence, he became a narcotic agent, you know, well, at that time, you know, he wanted me to, after I got out, he t took me over to his house for, for dinner, and we were having dinner, 
And when he took off his coat, I saw two big uh, pistols, you know, and I didn't know what was happening there. And he told me then that he had become a a narcotic agent. So, you know, he tried to uh, induce me to to go along with him on, uh, you know, because he figured that I know a lot of uh, narcotic pushes from prison and so forth, you know. And, you know, that's one of the, the regrets I have because I have absolutely no compassion whatsoever for a, for a, a drug pusher. I, I believe all drug pushers are mass murderers, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I often wondered, you know, whether I had made a mistake there and not trying to help him because he turned out to be a very effective narcotic agent. And, you know, the day after I got out of prison in 1969 on a special uh, parole, he had made one of the biggest captures of his whole life. Yeah, but you couldn't, by reflex, in your very being, you couldn't be an informer. That's no, I couldn't possibly no. do that because, yeah. you see, I was brought up in a neighborhood where where from the day I was born, probably, you know, I was uh, taught that you this never This is in the Brooklyn, tell, the Brooklyn dock yeah, area. The, the Irish town section of Brooklyn. I was told, you know, you're never to tell on anybody anything you see. And I, I, uh, I adhered to that religiously all throughout my life. And in writing this book, <clears throat> you know, I try to tell everything that has possibly happened to me and uh, the, about the prisons and about the way people think and so forth. And I think it, uh, this book contains a lot of messages for a lot of different people. I don't believe anybody can read this book that won't say to himself, geez, here's a, a totally wasted life. You know, I had a very high potential when I was a young man. I had a very retentive memory, and uh, I used to get the... Uh, A's and without even effort, you know, in school and so forth. So I did waste the great potential. Now, not only is the message there for people to see that crime is a futile a pursuit, but it also, I think, uh, would help people like on my escapes from these here uh, maximum security prisons. Even the inmates wouldn't give a plug nickel for my chance of hitting that street. And it's not easy to escape from a prison. It takes By the way, this, this deals with some of your prison life, life as well as your uh, quite remarkable escape from Holmesburg, uh, as a Holmesburg prison in Pennsylvania. That's right. And Sing Sing, wasn't there? Your well, that was the last yeah. escape I made. Yeah. And that was the most yeah. difficult yeah. of all. But what I'm trying to point out yeah. is a lot of, oh, everybody has their problems. But I think a lot of people give up on their problems too quick. Because if you use determination and perseverance and willpower, you can almost uh, solve any well, kind see, of a situation. In your case, it's quite obvious, Willie Sutton, you, you are quick, you're nimble-witted, mm-hmm. you're brilliant. You could tell by, the, by the, the very nature of the way you held up a bank or the way you escaped from security-proof, you know, almost escape-proof prisons, mm-hmm. your technique. You could have been a hell of a good lawyer, couldn't you? Well, you know, I, uh, in the beginning there, I almost did become a lawyer, you know, and I often thought that that was the changing point of my life. A young friend of mine from the same neighborhood saw an advertisement in a magazine, and he sent to, to Chicago. Uh, La Salle Street was the, the street where this uh, uh, firm was that provided law books. And they would let you look at these law books for 30 days, and then if you wanted them, you had to pay an installment money each uh, week or so forth. So this friend of mine put my name on it, and that all these law books came to me, and boy, I was an avid reader at that time. I uh, (coughs) read assiduously, and uh, oh, I was very much interested in law, but my people told me to send it back. They couldn't afford to pay for them. So you might have become a Clarence Darrow. You liked Darrow, didn't you? Oh, yes, Clarence Darrow was one of my great heroes yeah. in my young but days. Because I'm thinking about this ability and this talent that you have. You became later on a jailhouse lawyer. It didn't, you, you worked on some yeah, of your I cases, put, too. I put 12 years in a real hard study into law. Did you help other prisoners, too? Uh, you helped fellow inmates, oh, didn't yeah, you? Oh, yeah, I helped quite a number of people get out. And more important, I, I had a lot of sentences reduced. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it only takes certain uh, people, you know, these people I, I thought that really wanted to go straight. 
and I'd had language difficulties and things of that kind, you know. Naturally, I would never help anybody in yeah. life for drugs yeah. or rape yeah. or anything like that. I want to come that. back to you and your, because it is artistry, you and the banks, how it began. You had early teachers. There was a, there was a, one of your early mentors was a Dr. Tate. That's right. Dr. Tate. That's right. Now, what was his approach? Well, his approach was, you see, he was a safe cracker, you know. <laughs> he used to punch safes, and he used to work with three men. And I used to have to be, I was one of them, and a couple other friends and so forth. And we would go, we would never, we would always come out of New York, but we'd never work in New York, you know. We'd work all throughout the New England states and out to Pittsburgh and uh, Scranton, uh, Wilkes-Barre, all these places, you know. And uh, we return over to, after the weekend, uh, you know, foray, we would return to New York. So uh, I got along there for years without even getting arrested, you know. And uh, But he was the one that really first taught me that violence never pays because he would never never hurt anybody, this fellow. This fellow was, I think he graduated from uh, some university in Chicago. He's a very intelligent person, and uh, he was always practicing, uh, you know, nonviolence. You know, if you get arrested and you don't have any pistol, you only get a couple of years at the very most. Now, he used to work on that uh, thing, you know. If I get arrested, I'll get two years or something, you know. He'd do his two years, and he'd come out, and he'd go along again. But uh, he was uh, he was death on violence. He wouldn't have even to walk a uh, half a block with you, you know. So from him, you learned the technique of safe cracking combinations. Oh yes, I learned a lot from him because you know he used to always get these devices. You know, anything that's put together can be taken apart. You know, if you have the patience to do it. So like you know, new locks or anything that come out, he would always buy them. You know, no matter how much they cost. You know, and he would. Uh, uh, fool around with it until he had uh, some way of solving the, the thing, you know? But then challenges came that you met that he couldn't quite meet. Right. Uh, the new uh, lock companies and right. the safe vault were making tougher and tougher steel. That's right, hardened steel. Mm-hmm. You know, they were using that manganese in order to harden the steel and so forth, and it was much more difficult to but work now on. you called upon your own past, because sometime one long ago you worked learning the acetylene torch. That's right, you in the docks. In, uh, the I docks. worked on the docks. As the, as and so he never, so Dr. Tate didn't know what to do about that, did he? No, he, uh, you know, he took great pride in what he did, you know, that... Uh, <coughs> That was his method, and he thought it would endure forever, but it never did. And uh, he couldn't see any kind of new innovations being put through, and he he didn't have the foresight to actually uh, see how it was becoming more difficult to to operate the way he did. And so then you... So I branched out for myself, you know, on that uh, South Ozone Park National Bank, and... uh, then later on, I uh, was trying to figure from that bank. I had to leave that bank because the, the, the employees came early in the morning. And I had figured that, you know, if I could have stayed there just for another 10 or 15 minutes, that job would have been a success, you mm-hmm. know? So I think that was one of the turning points in directing me toward getting in in the morning and. Uh, you know. This is what I refer to as your leap of imagination. Right. So what happened here, you yeah. were thinking the traditional way, beyond Dr. Tate, settling right. torches, but you had yeah. to finish at a certain time, you couldn't get through the steel. But if another way were used, mm-hmm. without the torch, you know, yeah. without safe crack, and that yeah. way is the use of the people in the bank. Right. That's and right. so here's now you studied. Now you became a student of habit, didn't you? Yes, I did. I think everybody is a, is, a, is a victim of habits, you know, especially those that work and the, they go to work the same time. They usually take the same bus at the same street corner, you know, and go a certain distance and get off and go to work and so forth. But I think most all of us are victims of, uh, of habit. And uh, <clears throat> particularly like bank employees, they arrive almost on the dot. Of, uh, so how long a time do you spend casing a bank in the habits? Well, it was different uh, periods, you know, no less than two weeks, and some of them took six weeks. 
because a lot of different uh, things would happen. Like, for instance, I would be watching the bank. You know, I didn't only watch the bank in the morning. I'd come around in the afternoon to see if any uh, bank trucks were loading money or unloading money. And I'd come around late in the night to watch that place, you know? Now, you know, I used to, uh, for instance, uh, watch a bank there, and all of a sudden, when the bank closed at 5 o'clock, there was an inrush of uh, other people. I was wondering who they were, and it turned out that they were auditors, and they were examining the bank's books. Well, that naturally would push my time schedule down. Maybe it would take two or three weeks in order to, uh, to straighten that out, you know? And so you would do that. Also, you like the idea of heavy traffic. Oh, yeah. I worked in great crowds, you know. I, I, uh, I'm a great believer that, uh, you know, it's very easy to get lost in the crowd, you know. And uh, <coughs> a lot of places where you can't park a car, for instance, you know, that uh, you'd have to park it quite a distance away because, <coughs> you know, the streets are crowded and the traffic is immense and the passerbys are so great that, you know, you could walk out and you get in the crowd and you could walk two or three blocks away to, to, to get in your car and uh, just uh, roll yeah. away. Uh, or sometimes you are spotted, you, you figure well, the policeman will not shoot into the crowd. Well, yeah, that's you, one of the yeah. things, you know. The, you know, uh, the police don't get uh, a lot of credit. You know, I, I have the greatest respect for policemen. And... Uh, and they have respect for you. I think so, too. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, they have a tough job, and it's getting tougher all the time with all of these new issues coming up, you know? And uh, th those people deserve the backing of every law-abiding citizen, you know? They can't do the job all by themselves. I'm thinking about you and uh, the what was known as your calling card, your... They would know, how would the authorities, uh, the detectives, the police know it was a Willie Sutton job? Well, after, <coughs> after, I got, after that Bassett got arrested, see, I operated quite a long time before they knew, you know who was uh, operating because uh, <coughs> they were shifting police captains and everything over this. They thought the police were working in on it, you know? And uh, when he got arrested, uh, I think he put me in on uh, 15 jobs or something like that, you know, banks and so forth. And he told them about... Who was this? Oh, some former colleague of yours. This was my first accomplice yeah. that got arrested. Yeah. And he exposed my modus operandi mm -hmm. to the police. And mm -hmm. from then, they actually knew... And and one thing was, like, if there was any kind of a crime committed with violence, they immediately uh, knew it was not you. dismissed it to yeah. me as being yeah. implicated, you know, because they know that I never use violence. So, but finally they got to know the Willie. We'll, we'll return in a moment. Yeah. After we hear this message to my guest, Willie Sutton, who was the, uh, well, I just but describe him as an artist of bank robbers, the most uh, a folk hero. We'll come to the matter of what it means to be a folk hero among certain people. Uh, the book is The Memoirs of a Bank Rob, which he wrote in collaboration with Edward Lynn and uh, Viking, the publishers. And it's, by the way, a very... It's an informative book. <laughs> it's not a how-to book. <laughs> it's an informative book, but it's also a witty one. And in a certain way, a uh, certain uh, picture of a certain part of our society revealed in a moment. More of that, and as well as Willie Sutton's experiences in jail and in courtrooms, too, after this message. We're talking to Willie Sutton. Yourself, how many? But how many banks did did you rob? Did, did, have you lost track? About a hundred. Yeah. All part different parts of the country. That's right. Yes. What would the total haul have been? This is uh, the usual question. Well, I think about a, a million dollars. About I million. got you know. But they, I use a lot of that money, you know, for good purposes. That's the only thing that holds me in good stead here. That I think I did a lot of good for a lot of poor people. You used to pass your door around. That's right. By the way, you, you were a good... Sp uh, Dr. Tate, too. Many of the... Mm. Uh, <coughs> how shall I put it? Unconventional people, bank robbers, are very big tippers and spenders, aren't they? That's you have right. a theory about that, don't you? Yes, I think, uh, <coughs> I think everybody that steals, more or less, they know that they, uh, they don't have any self-respect or the respect of anybody else, and they think by overcompensating by tipping and giving large tips, they more or less uh, feel that uh, 
that they do have a little respect and so forth. They do have the respect of those that get the tips. So they're buying. That's right. Respect they're trying or to buying buy, affection. They're, they're trying to buy something that money doesn't buy. That's what it and is. So it's buying it. Uh, right. Yeah. We come back. Well, your thoughts, your experiences in courtrooms are interesting. And you've come to the conclusion that an innocent person mm-hmm. in a courtroom has a rougher time than a guilty person. You have a theory about that. That someone who was guilty right. has better luck in a courtroom than an innocent person. Well, I will tell you, you know, there's a lot of innocent people. You know, an innocent person doesn't think, think, doesn't think like a thief. Naturally, a thief is always trying to protect <coughs> himself and cover up what he's doing. So naturally, he's trying to establish false alibis and things like that, where the innocent person, through circumstances, may get arrested for some crime that he never, never committed. And circumstances can be so damning that any jury in the world will convict these people, you know, because they have really no defense. And they never think of a defense, and the result is usually they don't have any money, and uh, some uh, lawyer is thrown at them that's overworked, like a legal aid uh, lawyer and so forth. He's got too many cases. He can't give the investigation of the case the proper care and attention and time that it requires and the result is that sometimes these people are even induced to plead guilty and I met some of them in prison and it's not an uncommon thing I don't say you know there's a very big majority but there are some people and even one innocent person in in prison is really a crime in itself whereas the person who is guilty the thief he knows enough to bank on legalities. That's right. right. Whereas the innocent person doesn't think of that. That's he right. thinks morally. Right. You see, I mean, like a person, like an innocent person that's arrested and thrown in jail, he, he goes into a state of shock. He can't really think properly, you know, and he don't know what to do or where to turn for help. And the result is that uh, he doesn't get the help that he really needs. Now, you, Willie, said you, you've never copped a plea. Well, I did in Philadelphia because mm-hmm. I was so uh, well known there, and <coughs> I was so well uh, 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 close to these uh, this here Corn Exchange Bank. I was in there twice. That uh, that I didn't have a chance, you know. And I, you know, when you go, mm-hmm. say like you come from one city to another and you commit a crime, then you know they they're just going to show you that yeah. they're not going to. Oh, in people. that case, I mean, though, when you have witnesses on your behalf, right? Uh, you felt you could never double cross those witnesses. Oh no! By copying oh, a no. plea, I had an instance. You would just soon be guilty. I had an instance that's almost belie- unbelievable. I was uh, I was innocent one time. That's why I say this. I was innocent one time, and, and, and the circumstances were so damning that after the defense rested, uh, my lawyers come down and says, look, the judge says that you ought to take a plea because you're going to be convicted and sentenced to, to the electric chair. Well, I had legitimate witnesses on this, you know, and the whole thought that entered my mind, mm. these people are going to get arrested for perjury, and they didn't mm. perjure themselves, mm. they told the truth. So I said, no, I said, I'd rather go to the electric chair, and I said, jeopardize any people that uh, came forth and testified mm-hmm. for me, you know. And uh, fortunately, I, I got acquitted. Mm-hmm. And my lawyers told me, you no, know, keep in mind that I'm innocent, they told me that every day I live I should consider profit. Because yeah, that was a great risk you took that in this book, in your book, of course, here, yes. the, where the money was. You you mm. talk about this incident of this big mess, and you were obviously falsely accused of this particular murder. By the way, before we come to you and your prison experiences, and this involves Attica and Dannemora, as well right. as Holmesburg, right. and you saw Attica coming long before it came, too. Right. Before that, uh, you talk about uh, being given a third degree. You describe a technique, the good cop and the bad cop. Right. You know, McPhee and and, uh, McCoy. Right. Why don't you just go into that for a moment? Well, you see, like, uh, a couple of detectives, they team up. One is the rough guy. He wants to beat you to death, you know, and the other guy is always intervening. Well, look, he's a pretty good fella. Don't hit him, you know. And he wants to get a chance to talk to you, you know, and tell you how brutal this guy is, and he, he'll kill you in a minute. Now, look at uh, 
this same thing is it's closed case we have all the evidence we need it's just a case of adding a little more to what we got and so forth you know and the other guy comes roaring into the thing with a big rubber hose he wants to hit you on the head with it and it's a real <coughs> act you know they're, they're they're actors too a lot of you have been uh, clobbered oh, a bit oh yeah pretty I've good been, yes uh, but uh, you know that's one of the reasons I could never really condemn my partners for, for, for talking on me. You see, nobody knows just how much punishment they can take <coughs> until it actually happens, you know? But I learned there back there in 31 that people could kill me and I would never tell them what, anything I didn't want to do. You know, I didn't want to tell them, see? But I, I realized this, this went on for four days or so, but I realized that there's a lot of people that are much weaker than I am, you know, and uh, they're more prone to uh, confess very easily, you know? And uh, I always took that into consideration, even in regards to my partners. You know, I, I guess I'm supposed to hate them because they got me so much time and all, but I never really did. I always said to myself, well, these people are a whole lot weaker than you are, so you have to look, overlook I noticed one thing throughout this book. It's this particular tenor that pervades here. You have no... any fury. You have no... you never had... Here's you. You went through an awful lot, but, mm -hmm. but you have no hate in the book, uh, which I find rather astonishing. You mm -hmm. weren't out to get anybody when you got out. No, no, uh, I wasn't. I, uh... I really never really hated anybody, even the cops. You know, I always figured, you know, I'm in a, a dangerous business. It's up to the cops to get me. And when they got me, I never had any animosity toward them people. You know, that's their job, you know, to make arrests whenever they can. And you figured and this And my was job was to try to avoid getting arrested. Yeah, so you, by the way, you would look, uh, you would get up, you describe it somewhere, getting up in the morning, like right. anyone else gets up to go to work, you were going to work. Right, that's so this, right. This particular week could be casing a certain bank, say, right. in, the, in uh, the Midwest somewhere, mm. wherever it was. Mm. And that's a day at work. So you had a lot of time. It was a relaxed, you describe it, kind of relaxed kind of work. Yeah. At the beginning. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I uh, just took this as a business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I operated on it as if it was legal. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew in my conscience it wasn't mm -hmm. legal, you know. I, I don't, I can't rationalize to that extent, you know. But, you know, I try to convince myself in order to put myself in a position where, you know, I wouldn't be suspicious or anything, that I would actually build my confidence up that I'm supposed to be doing this thing and that somebody expects me to do it, you know? And, like, when I'd walk into a bank, I'd actually believe that I was a bank employee, you know, after so many jobs. You came to believe that. Huh? Yeah, you came, came to, to believe, believe that. that. By the way, you also weren't... When I used a, a policeman's uniform, I try to uh, adopt the, 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 you know, the, the philosophy of a cop you know, what he would do and so forth. And I passed many policemen dressed in the uniform, you know, I gave them the salute and they gave me the salute back <laughs> and so forth. And you if know. you warned some people about illegal parking, right. you warned some people, That's now right. don't park the car That's there. That's right. You, you, but you see, yeah. it occurs to me they call you Willie the actor. Right. He was, but it occurs to you more than that. You're a method actor. You know what method acting is, right. don't you? Yes. You were using the Stanislavski technique. Right. Well, you were that is, you had the uniform, and you came to believe that. Right. That's true. That's, well, that's very true. Well, that's what you are. And that's the way I operated, and uh, I guess that's the way I built my own yeah. confidence, you know. But on occasions you were caught. Now, how much time did you do all, overall? Well, that's the whole thing. I've been about 35 years of my life in prison. I'm 75 today. And, uh, <coughs> in fact, I often <laughs> think it's some sort of a miracle that I've lived this long, you know, in the certain circumstances. I had a lot of bullets fired at me, you know, and we came pretty close. They never hit me. And the first thing they do when they want to take your bat battalion record and so forth, they look around and see how many bullet holes you have. And, and they were always surprised that I didn't have any. So you have theories, of course. You've come to conclusions about prison life and prisons today. Right. And you have many... Uh, well, see, I do a lot of speaking. I like to uh, make uh, prison self-sustaining and take it uh, off the burden of 
burden of taxes off the backs of the people. Now, these here prisons can be put on a self-sustaining basis. They can make enough money to pay for the correction officers and the officials of a prison and also the convicts and make them send half of their money home and take their families off relief and so forth and so forth. I uh, mentioned somewhat in a, a brief way in the, in the, in the book uh, exactly what this here thing is. And I would like to say this. I appeared in, uh, in the Boston there, and I was on the same panel with a man that was a commission of, uh, of prisons for 37 years in the state of Massachusetts. And when I, uh, I uh, spoke about this plan of putting the prisons on a self-sustaining basis, he told me after 37 years of experience, he says, Willie, this thing should have been put in prisons 100 years ago. But you know, there's a lot of uh, things wrong with a prison. Most of the people don't know anything about prison policy or how they operate or anything like this. But in Massachusetts now, they have a lot of citizens go in and look at prisons and talk to inmates, not the favored inmates but all of them, and they see what they can come up with, what kind of suggestions. Mm. The people can't afford to build new prisons every year. You were talking about, uh, you and the book of Danamora, as you were sing saying that Danamora is the Siberia of prisons, and then you were in Attica. Right. There was a Danamora riot in 1929. Right. But then you were in Attica before this riot occurred. That's right. And you saw it coming, didn't you? You saw the oh, grievances. Oh, yeah. Well, it yeah. was there a couple of times. In fact, I single-handedly uh, quieted things down. And uh, <coughs> anybody that uh, was associated with prisons, whether it's inmates or correction officers or officials of a prison, they all knew that it was coming, but uh, nobody ever did anything to... Uh, to uh, circumvent those things, you know. They just keep making promises that they never fulfill. And, uh, you know, every prison in the country is overcrowded today, and that's going to lead to a lot of more rebellions and a mm. lot of more debts. Mm. And they certainly better do something about this thing. In one case, to, to protest conditions, you, you went on a hunger strike. One case, that's yeah. right. You see, that was I had a motive there, you know. Because I had been so helplessly, so hopelessly uh, buried, as you say, in isolation, I don't think I would ever got out under this here hard-boiled warden Smith. And uh, my only uh, relief was to try to be uh, transferred to some other prison, you know, where I might meet a more humane warden that would give me another chance, you know. So <clears throat> that was the reason I went on a hunger strike, you know. The whole thing is, I don't know, I must have an indomitable spirit, you know. Fourteen of us started on this strike. I didn't want to go win it because I told them, I said, you people will give up too quick. Oh, no, no, we'll all stick with you. <clears throat> so at the end of 14 days, I was the only lone guy on the, on the strike, and I continued to do until I got a concession. You must have been a skeleton. Huh? You? you were a skeleton. That's right? right. I lost tremendous uh, weight and everything. In fact, they sent me to the hospital on there, you know, because, you know, I was pretty close to death. And this here warden came in, he told me, he said, all right, Willie, he says, I'm going to send you to the hospital. He said, all the other guys, he says, uh, quit on you. He says, you're the only one that's left. Which so leads to the question about He says, I'm going to transfer you. You made it. Your escapes. How did you manage? Your eyes? These were escape-proof. Again, yeah, here's see, use of takes, the imagination it, it again. It takes infinite care, and it takes a lot of time. You see, like, it's not like outside. Like, if you want a tool or something, you walk in a hardware store and you get it. Sometimes it takes you a month to get a certain kind of a tool or a certain piece of steel to make a, uh, a, 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 a lock pick out of something like that, you know? So, <clears throat> so it does take an awful lot of time, and it takes an awful lot of patience, you know? And uh, I think I have uh, a lot of both of those mm. things, you know. But there's uh, one case, again, your, the use of psychology. There was someone in the prison who was a rat, Lang. Right. He betrayed. But you but you made a discovery. You used him. You called upon his own need right. to be liked. Would That's you describe right. the situation? Where was this? And, Holmesburg. Well, yeah. That was in Holmesburg, yeah. You see, he. Uh, there's a lot of people like... Uh, you know, he told me that he was framed up, that he never talked on anybody. And the two people that was arrested with him, he claimed that they were arrested first. 
and they were smart enough to put the blame on him for doing the one you're talking, talking about now has a reputation among all the prisoners as being that's right a rat. And see once you get a reputation of being a rat nobody will have anything to do with you see and uh, when I was in uh, Holmesburg, I was on the isolation block, and they used to keep him there more or less for protection, you know. So, you know, I started talking to him, and uh, finally I uh, persuaded him that uh, the only way that he could uh, establish, reestablish himself with the inmates was to help me, you know. And uh, he finally did, and that's the one way, one reason I got out of Holmesburg, which was a very, very... Uh, a uh, small chance in the beginning. Yeah. So this guy, who was the informer in prison, the rat, did not betray you because you called upon something. Right. Because he wanted you to like him. That's not, not yeah. only me, but he yeah. wanted to try yeah. to get his self-respect yeah, back that's through me. amazing, yeah. You know? But also how, and even though there's no honor among thieves, in this instance, certain guys went out of their way. Right. Like Georgie Nelson. Right. Went, took a risk to, to help you. That, I guess the important is sometimes for the prisoner's state of mind if somebody can escape and make it? Right. You see, you'll, you'll get a lot of people to help you, but you'll also get a lot of people that will uh, try to curry favor with the, with, the, with the officials in order to get a uh, break on their sentences and so forth. And they far outnumber the ones that would help you. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, by yeah. far, yeah. yes. That's a sad commentary. Yeah, that's the yeah. sad the commentary. And the mo more would betray you than help you. Oh yes, by yeah. by. Uh, see, that's the way prisons operate on by uh, operate through their informers, mm. and <clears throat> you know the the most everything is uh, you know you have to know exactly who you're picking, mm. and otherwise, like for instance, if I had guessed wrong on Langy. Mm -hmm. I would have probably got my head blown off. Mm -hmm. You know, they would probably let me try, and they'd be waiting for me. Yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, the judgment of people sometimes can be very yeah. erroneous, as you, you did, know, some of way, my did, partners proved. Willie, you did a lot of reading while you were in prison. Oh, I read yeah. assiduously. Yeah. I read everything I possibly could, all of the philosophers, the good books of literature, and the hundred best books of uh, Things and oh, I, I read so much on different things. I studied political science. I did, you know, studied law for twelve years, and uh, I was six years with Doctor Roach studying psychiatry and so forth. You know, you had a lot of time. Yeah, well, see, there's a saying in, in prison: "Don't save time, make time save you." And I try to follow that out, and I uh, kept myself very mentally uh, occupied all the time I was in prison. So that's so. This is how you became the uh, jailhouse lawyer too, and helped others. Yes, that's right. You know, so we come to one of the ironic and tragic aspects in the life of Willie Sutton that had nothing to do with you, and yet because it's the Alvin Schuster case. Perhaps you describe this. Some people may not know who Alvin Schuster was. You were out now. You were being sought after. You were the number one. You were number one on the list, weren't yes, you? Yes, that's right. On the FBI list, that's the right. The most sought after. Uh, criminal, right? Who's on, who's on the lam? That's right. And everybody's looking for you. Your, your face is everywhere, right? Right. In fact, you're a, in some quarters. You're a folk hero. Right. I think so. Yeah. But, uh, by the way, you're a folk hero among black people, weren't you? Well, yes. They. They. Uh, you see, I. I think that uh, I often give a little thought to that, and uh, you know, I help a lot of poor people, and and poor people all always have dreams. You know, they always have dreams that they're going to get a lot of money. Some. Some lost relative is going to die and leave them a million, or a big bag of money is going to fall off a truck and so forth, and they're going to be wealthy, and all their economic uh, ills will be washed away and so forth. I think I operated more or less as their, uh, well, vicariously. I did a lot of these things that uh, they would do, but, uh, you know, they... Uh, uh, didn't for certain reasons, and uh, I think like they uh, followed me in my acts, you know, as if that uh, they would want to do something like that, but there was too much uh, against it. But you were the outsider who was beating authority, in a way, to them. Yes. The outsider right. beating authority. That's and right. what about you when the police, when we'll come to Alvin Schuster in a moment, mm -hmm. Arnold Schuster, uh, the police, when they arrested you, they were they were excited too. You were a celebrity too, weren't you? Oh yeah, because I you know I operated over a fifty year period, and 
you know, I've become more or less a legend, I guess, with people. You know, their fathers knew me, and they tell their sons about me and so forth. <clears throat> but <clears throat> but uh, I believe that uh, uh, people don't want their legends destroyed. Yeah. You well, know, they to want to <clears throat> keep them alive. So you're on the subway now. You're being looked for at a right. young kid named Arnold Schuster who studies right. pictures, spots you, and tells the cops. Right. See, I always, uh, you know, uh, uh, pay a lot of attention to faith. Now, th there was a case where I ran to get a, a, a subway train, and I just about caught the door was just closing. Now, if that door closed, Arnold Schuster would be alive today, you know? And he was a very handsome boy, and I often thought, here's a boy born 40 years after me, and yet... He became, like, involved in, in Suppose you me. tell that, because uh, he, he went to the police, they arrested you, and Arnold Schuster is now on television. Right. And you have, of course, nothing to do with this, but somebody, yeah. and one of the mob guys, yeah, Anastasia. Yeah, that's why Anastasia did that. He was the chief executioner for the mafia. Now, why did he do it? Well, I think, too, we maybe to instill fear in the, the people that worked with him or something like that. You know, they say, you know, like... Uh, uh, they looked upon him as an informer or a rat or whatever they want to call him, you know. But here's a boy that never could possibly harm me, you know, once I got arrested, you know. But he could never possibly no, harm me. He could never be a witness in my case or nothing like that, you know. It was all cut and dry. They owed over 100 years at this, this time. Yeah. So they didn't even have to try me for another... Yeah. Crime, but, but they did, you know, in no, order to get publicity. The irony so is this: Willie Sutton, who ab abhors violence, right. has never used a gun. Abhors used with a young kid who fingered you. Right. Arnold Schuster is on television. Someone wholly unrelated to you, Anastasia, the mafia mob execution, sees this kid on TV. To someone hit him because right. he was an informer. He has nothing to do with you. Think, right. But it's to instill fear in possibly someone who might inform on him. Yeah, see, this Valachi testified yeah. in the, the Senate uh, hearing in 1963, and he was the one that uh, put the Anastasia into the thing. I don't know whether it's true or not, but, uh, you know, these people uh, have been investigating this case for 23 years. They spent more money on this case than any case they ever had in the history of the department, the New York Police Department. There's three different agencies uh, investigated, the government, the state, and the city. And after 23 years, they have a voluminous files on this, so I think that they should make all their findings known to the people yeah. who paid for this investigation. Yeah. I'm thinking of the I'm thinking of the irony of it. Uh, yes. you really said. And of course that hurt you the the, the well, assassination see, here's of this the thing. kid. Of you course. hear people say that I will do something and I will suffer the consequences. You see that isn't true. When anybody does anything in this life, it reflects upon everybody else. It doesn't only reflect upon themselves, it reflects upon their families, their friends, their neighbors or everybody that knows them. Yeah. You know, because when a person does something wrong, there's other people suffer probably more so than the wrongdoer. So, Willie, I'm thinking now that there's much in your book here that's nimble, quick, and illuminating. Toward the end, you're finally out, thanks to the woman lawyer, the friend of yours. Yeah, uh, Catherine, Catherine Betzis. Catherine, and you're out. Right. And finally, you see the skyline of New York. Right. And I'll tell you this, I, I have a... A very healthy respect for freedom. You see, most people take their freedom for granted, but it's the most valuable asset that anybody had, and once you lose it, you will pay everything you ever hoped to get to get it back again. And now, Willie Sutton, you're retired, but you're a memoirist. You are writing some more. What, any, any, a lot of bases we haven't touched. Anything you feel like saying before we sign off now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Willie Sutton, my guest, where the money was is the book, The Memoirs of a Bank Robber. Edward Lynn, your collaborator, Viking, the publishers. And he, uh, we've about hit it, I think, haven't we? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we covered quite a lot, yes. Not as much as in the book, but we did cover quite a lot. <laughs> 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 Willie Sutton, my guest. Uh, Thank you very much.